run motivated me to continue with the development of my direct granule extruder. The prototype in version 3 is now working very reliably, so it is time to talk about the technical details. Same as all predecessors, this model was also created following my traditional production method, meaning most parts are handcrafted from materials I found in a hardware store around my corner. Same as conventional extruders, my version also consists of a cold end... ...and a hot end, both of which are made of a 16x16mm aluminum square bar. The approximately exact dimensions and positions of the holes can be found on my website. Consider that this machine was created with some parameters following the rule of thumb. The two zones are separated by a piece of glass in order to minimize the flow of heat from the hot to the cold side. I cut the 25x25mm block with the help of an electric tile cutter with water cooling for the diamond coated disc. Afterwards I drilled an approximately 9.5mm hole with a dremel and a diamond coated drill bit, also with water cooling. A temperature gradient must be maintained in the extruder during operation, for which the hot end is heated electrically with the help of a heating cartridge... ...while the cold end is cooled with the help of a fan. In the hot end, the temperature has to be high enough for the plastic to melt... ...while in the cold end the temperature must be kept below the glass point, which is the temperature at which the plastic becomes soft. The more heat flows from the hot end to the cold end, the more the hot end has to be heated and the cold end to be cooled, efficiency is the keyword. Glass has a thermal conductivity that is 100 times lower than that of aluminum, which is why I use it as a heat barrier. The granules are fed from the cold end and forwarded to the hot end along a teflon tube with an inner diameter of 8mm and an outer diameter of around 10mm. This is necessary in order to keep the friction along the tube walls low, because the weak stepper motor that had previously driven the filament now moves the auger screw. Also in order to keep the heat transfer low, the screw connection between the hot end and the cold end is made using two rather long pieces of 3mm threaded rods and small angles made of 0.5mm sheet metal. Not only for electricity, but also for the flow of heat there is. Thin and long means that the resistance is high and in this case, that's what is wanted. Another advantage is that with this fastening construction, the holes running through cold end and hot end can easily be aligned. Manual work is always associated with larger tolerances and connections that can be adjusted using threaded rods are Dabbler's best friend. Let's have a look at the core element, the auger screw. This consists of a simple wood screw with a diameter of 5mm and a total length of 105mm. At the tip I hard soldered a 25mm long piece of 1.5mm wire. I widened the neck of the press nozzle with a 3mm drill so that the plastic can pass this point with less friction, otherwise the tip of the screw would more or less lock that bottleneck. A nut for 8mm bolts is soldered to the screw head. This fits into the shaft of the large gear that drives the screw. Backlash as a design feature and the length of the shaft allow the screw to rotate with the gear wheel, but otherwise move freely, especially in axial direction. With a small gear on the stepper motor, there is a reduction of 3.3 to 1. The stepper motor including the gears is connected to the rest of the mechanics via four threaded rods. Thanks to those rods, the drive can be adjusted in height, which is very useful when experimenting with different types of screws, because for the function of the extruder, it is important how deep the screw dives into the mechanics.
In contrast to conventional extruders, my approach is that the screw drives the granules from the cold side only and so pushes the plastics forward to the hot end. Tests have shown that the screw should sometimes dive a bit deeper into the melting zone in order to be able to work with the low torque of the stepper motor. In the version with the wire tip used here, the stepper motor is adjusted so that the screw has between 2 and 3 mm clearance in height. Whenever granules are pushed into the extruder, the screw is raised by the opposing force until the screw head hits the large gear. The function of the wire tip is to close the nozzle whenever the extruder goes into reverse. Then the screw dives deeper into the extruder until the tip hits the nozzle and ideally closes the tip of the extruder to prevent stringing. If closing the nozzle doesn't really work because the handmade construction is simply not precise enough, the screw starts pulling the granules out of the extruder as long as the screw continues to move with the reverse direction while the tip of the screw has hit the bottom of the extruder. This corresponds to the classic retract of conventional filament extruders. Let's now answer a question that has been asked nearly a thousand times. Why don't you use one of those wood drills that almost look like a real auger screw? The answer I have given a thousand times and will do so never again is... The pitch makes the difference. With the same diameter, the pitch of a wood screw is much smaller than that of a wood drill. The pitch corresponds to the reduction of a gear unit. The granules are forwarded by 18mm per revolution with the 6mm drill shown here... ...while the 6mm wood screw only moves the plastics for 3mm. With the low pitch of the wood screw, even the low torque stepper motor I'm using manages to push the granules through the extruder. Another advantage are the better dosing capabilities. If the screw must rotate a larger angle in order to push a certain amount of granules through the extruder, the reverse conclusion is, with the same angle of rotation, less plastic is coming out of the nozzle. When printing fine details, less is more. And if you don't believe me, build your own extruder using a wood drill. I tried it out and found wood screws to be much more suitable. To get extruded, the granules must enter the extruder somewhere, which happens at the upper side of the cold end. The Teflon tube does not go through the whole aluminum bar because friction with the walls of the bore is needed at the entry point. To make the wood screw grip the plastic grains, they must jam on the edge of the hole, otherwise they would just rotate with the screw around the top of the hole. Not until a granule has entered the hole, the spiral can start to push the plastic downwards. The small groove on top of the cold end supports the gripping of the granules. So much about the construction principles for now, let's start some test prints. Following the good old RepRap spirit, I printed the stepper pinion at a speed of 10mm per second in the first video about this extruder prototype. The print quality was more than sufficient to get a working gear, measuring only 25mm in diameter. But that can also be done faster. Here seen at 20mm per second. As before, a nozzle with a diameter of 1mm is used, the layer height is set to 0.2mm and the extrusion width to 0.7mm. Looks fine, too. Even 30mm per second lead to a good print result. I have increased the print speed by adjusting the so called frame rate to 300% in the printer menu. The file created in Slicer on the SD card is for 10mm per second, which at 300% results in the 30mm per second seen here. 
If the frame rate is increased to 400% corresponding to 40mm per second, the result is obviously a little worse. The reason is not the extruder, but rather the inexpensive printer used whose weak mechanics bends and starts to vibrate. In principle, 60mm per second is still possible, but only in principle. The whole table starts shaking. In addition to the weak mechanics of the printer, the construction of the extruder is anything but perfect, there's still plenty of potential to optimize the weight and size. The heavy stepper motor at the top is far from the axis of the timing belt and the guiding rods, which boosts the vibrations. A large mechanics is better for the experimentation phase, because all components are easy to access and everything can be readjusted if necessary, but one of the next steps has to be to find a more compact solution, I'm working on it, the needed materials are ordered. However, I won't put the existing mechanics into the blender yet, in the next video I'll talk a bit more about the specifications of this stage of my granules extruder. A print error can be seen in the lower area of the gear, this comes from the fact that I pushed the entire printer back and forth on the table of my video studio in order to be able to take the long shots and now the close ups again. It can also be seen that the teeth bend upwards due to the lack of object cooling. All in all this handmade extruder prototype can cope with different printing speeds quite well. As said before, there are more videos about this extruder to come, especially print tests will demonstrate the capabilities of this machine. The end of this year's Hackaday prize is coming soon and I still have a lot to show for the jury and of course all of you out there. On my website and my Hackaday page you can see high resolution photos of the sample prints so that you can get a better impression of the print quality. If you would like to support my research financially, you are welcome to click the donate button on my pages, many thanks to all the great people who have already made use of it. Thanks for watching.